Hello, everyone, and thanks again for being a part of our second client convening. As Judy said, we are our previous one was two years ago. Um, the focus on DEI practices and advancements. And so we want to continue our learning. And when we were thinking about, hmm, what could we uh, talk about for a 2.0? Um, and it became clear that over the past three to five years, there's been a lot of changes in the world from, of course, um, the pandemic, COVID-19, um, climate change is issues, um, the affirmative action decision by the Supreme Court, lots happening. Um, and so we were curious, um, what is happening on the foundation side? What has um, stayed the same, but also what is very different? What is different? How have our clients responded to this um, shifting to brain as we talked about. So um, that's uh, the reason why we're together and based on the attendance. We're all curious to hear what's been happening, um, what has been changing at each of our foundations. And so we really hope this will be a time in which you can sh share your own stories as well as learn from others. Um, and um, as Judy said, uh, we hope that this will be a time in which you not only learn, but also an opportunity to build connections. So we're going to spend about 30 minutes or so in small groups um, in which you can share one on one, and then uh, we'll come to Heather at the end um, for continued conversation as well as just to um, document our learnings and things that we could take back um, to our respective um, foundations and funds. Um, there were a few issues that were raised when we did the survey when you RSVP'd. Um, so I just want to share those so that you know that we did pay attention <laughs> to those responses um, and, uh, and our speakers are gonna touch on those. And that included engaging your board and ongoing learning and understand the community needs, um, how we are lear learning together, um, how we're measuring impact and accountability and accountability. Um, the third uh, piece that, that folks said they wanted to learn more about was um, embracing risk as well as an innovation. And the fourth was um, how do you balance um, your urgent needs along with new initiatives? So we're gonna touch on each of those um, with the speakers as well as in our small groups. Um, so, um, I think we're going to transition uh, to our speaker, speaking of them, and we are so glad to have them to share their individual stories. Um, and we, when you RSVP'd, um, we did include their bios um, and LinkedIn um, information so that you can contact them if you so choose. Um, but our first speaker would be Maddie Rod Rodriguez. She is the uh, executive director of the Foley Hoag Foundation. And then um, after she speaks and have some time of Q&A, which you can pound her with questions, um, we'll be moving on to hearing from Karen Safferly, who's the executive director and art curator um, at Wellington management. So thanks for the two of you for being a part of our conversation and um, take it away, Maddie. Thanks very much, Alita. Um, and hi to everyone. It's great to see some familiar faces. And I'm also really looking forward to getting to know some new faces better when we get 
into the um, breakout rooms. Um, but as Shalita mentioned, I'm Maddie Rodriguez. I'm the executive director of the Foley Hoag Foundation, which is a foundation that had, came out of um, our law firm, Foley Hoag. Um, we started the foundation over 40 years ago um, using pro bono funds, attorney's fees that we were awarded um, in actually the Morgan v. Hennigan case. So in the Boston desegregation case, which we're commemorating the 50th anniversary of that decision this year. Um, so our mission is fairly broad. It has broadened over the years. Um, we address um, inequity in its various forms. So not just racial inequities, um, but any sort of inequities, wealth disparities, social justice, access to resources. And um, we do so um, in the three U.S. cities where our law firm has offices. And um, actually thinking about what are some of these changes that have happened over the last three to five years it has been that expansion um, specifically to our New York office. Um, we had expanded to DC probably closer to the 10-ish you know, years now, um, but this was a foundation that was very much Boston based. And you know, one of our challenges over the past three to five years has been um, really building up our reputation and getting in contact with organizations that fall within our guidelines so that they apply. Um, another big change that has happened uh, over the last several years is just me being the executive director. Um, despite the fact that the organization has been around for 40 plus years, we've never really had that formal leadership um, because it is maybe because it is housed in a law firm. So I am both a law firm partner. I'm a litigation partner. I'm an education attorney. Um, but I'm the executive director also of the foundation. And that's been really fun and has allowed us to do more in terms of our programmatic offerings and our structure. Um, I think the one thing that I do want to focus on, um, we also had some leadership changes, you know, our, our one of our original longest term trustees retired. And so, um, you know, we had some discussions internally about who would be the appropriate person to replace him. Um, but one of the biggest, I think, changes that has been the most exciting for me that I wanted to share and really goes well with this theme of how do you balance urgent needs against, you know, what is your bread and butter, what has been your longstanding practices is, you know, in 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, um, our firm, like many other corporations and businesses, wanted to have a meaningful response. And, and as part of that, um, and you know, meaningful support for civil rights organizations, um, social justice, racial justice oriented organizations. Um, and one of the ways that they did so was they made an extraordinary distribution to the foundation so that we could run a racial justice grant round and distribute funds to those organizations in record time for us. So accepting applications, reviewing them and distributing the funds within 30 days. Um, and we did so. And so we learned that we could do that, you know, aside from our regular grant rounds. And then the following year, when the murders happened in Atlanta and there was just this increased violence against the AAPI community, and we ran an AAPI special grant round and did the same thing in terms of distributing funds. But after those two years, after those things had happened, um, it set the precedent of us getting more money from our main funder, which is the law firm. Um, and we weren't going to give that up. We weren't going to give up that practice after showing that we could do it. And we decided that this would be a really great way of balancing our long term, you know, grant making strategy, of, you know, our regular grant rounds, which occurred in the spring and fall twice a year and finding a way to have a, a focus zero in on an issue that was affecting the communities that we serve and um, leveraging our impact more significantly and you know also having speaker series and other things throughout the year themed around that focus um, so the first year after that we did housing and homelessness housing insecurity and homelessness this past year we did youth um, behavioral health after seeing all of the reports in terms of learning loss and other behavioral and mental health issues in our schools um, following the pandemic, but really, you know, a trend that had been rising for some time. And we found that to be a really successful way, again, of zeroing in on something that where there is more urgent need, um, you know, learning more about the, the network of organizations that are working together to address these needs and, and finding a way to be a part of that. Um, I would say the last thing that has changed, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody on the call, but the need seems like it's so much greater um, lately. There are just so many, our, our, you know, our rounds are getting far more applications, I think, than we ever did. 
requests, urgent needs for far more funds than we ever had. And um, that was also a call for us, you know, because of course the, the instinct is to want to help and to want to give money to all of these incredible organizations. You know, it's, it's, it's rare when things are, are unworthy or, you know, that, you know, not in a stable place to receive our funding. Um, so that was really a call for us to get back to our fundamentals. Um, you know, we had these guidelines, but we hadn't really revisited them in a while. And they were also a little loosey goosey in, in a lot of situations. For example, we have a cutoff in terms of what the annual budget for the organization can be because we really want to focus on smaller organizations, you know, locally based community organizations. We add geographic restrictions you know, greater Boston, Metro DC, but what does that really mean? Um, so it allowed us to really focus in and, you know, it, it, it makes it a lot easier when those tough decisions come in, for, in front of you to be able to, you know, turn back to your values and those core guidelines. Um, so yeah, those are just a, a few things. Um, I know I speak quickly, so I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions that folks may have. Great, thank you so much, Maddie. Um, so we're just gonna open up the floor um, for any questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat um, as well as raise your hand. Um, I'm gonna put my view on calorie so I, I can see all the hands. Um, so I see one hand from Joanne. Um, you can take yourself off of mute and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, Betty, a couple questions. One is, um, have you seen a lot of requests for more um, organizational support versus programmatic support? And what have you done about that? Uh, and second is, um, have you increased the amount of the grants for these smaller organizations? And to what percentage, if you have, um, have you done that? Um, yes, definitely on the first question. And I think this is a situation where we've maybe relaxed some of our previous practices. We used to be almost kind of exclusive to wanting programmatic support or, you know, maybe if the organization was so small where the operation was the program, we would make an exception. But I think we've allowed for greater flexibility there, just understanding that, um, you know, folks need to be able to operate the the organization in order to serve folks. So thinking of, I think, a little bit more flexibly and broadly there, I think we would still hesitate to, you know, think that our dollars were just going for paper clips, um, you know, or, you know, like supplies, you know, things like that. But very rare that we get some sort of, you know, general, we still we still want to know what the funds are going to, I guess I have to say, and, and that it's something that's meaningful and going to be serving the population, but less concerned about it being tied to one specific program. And I'm sorry, what was your second question? Uh, just if you've increased the amount of the grants. Um, and if so, to what percentage, you know, what percentage? Yeah, this is tough because um, we're somewhat constrained in terms of being able to increase the grants and also maintain the same level of organizations that we are giving grants to. You know, our budget is somewhat fixed at the beginning of the year. There can be some, you know, variability, you know, depending on our independent fundraising outside of the distribution that we get from the law firm. Um, but we have been giving serious consideration to, you know, do we want to, you know, maybe trim one or two organizations a grant round that we would normally give to um, in order to make the grant sizes more meaningful. So I think that that is something in the past couple of years that we are playing with. I wouldn't say that we have an exact formula for this, but um, you're right that that's something that um, we're trying out and thinking about. Thank you. Um, can you, and I, I have a question in the ch ch chat, but does anyone um, want to raise their hand? Uh, Wendy's Wendy raising your hand. Wendy Fearnside does. Wendy, go ahead. Oh, you uh, please unmute yourself first. Thank you. Um. Yeah, well, as a as a generational difference here, I don't have a clue how to put the name of my foundation in, in my Zoom. So uh, I'm with the Conservation Food and Health Foundation, uh, which has um, uh, been operating since 1985 uh, as a small family foundation. 
And uh, it turns out we are grappling with many of the issues that Maddie just reviewed. And I guess I'd like to get some more information about how you establish relationships with organization, organizations that you would like to apply. I think that, that that's one of, of our issues. We really had a niche that we'd carved out early in, in our days, uh, which was to try to fund innovative things that were not established enough to, to attract the larger foundations so they could establish a track record. Um, yeah. And that's been very de that's been declining, and and I'm wondering if you uh, if you deal with that, and how how do you establish these relationships to increase the the number of applicants uh, that are doing what you what you want to fund? Yeah, we haven't really struggled with this in 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 Boston because we've been around for so long, and so like I said, we if anything we've seen an influx in applications. Also, our our guidelines in terms of our mission is is fairly broad, but I mean in New York and DC. Um, you know, number one, GMA has been very instrumental in terms of helping us identify the folks that we want to invite. Our, our DC and New York rounds are actually still invite only versus, you know, our Boston round is um, is an open call for applications. Um, I'm forgetting their name because they changed their name, but Chalita can remind me, we've also partnered with a specific DC organization that has not only been instrumental in allowing us to identify organizations to invite, but then to providing backend support, which is not something that we've traditionally done consistently for our organizations in terms of ongoing programming for them. Um, so that's a really great partnership. And we've seen our grantees sign up for their events and their programming, you know, I mean, really, really great numbers that, you know, indicate to us that that partnership is really worthwhile. I'll say the other thing to the extent that you are a foundation and you don't have really clear people on your website of who to contact, which was for a long time, our issue. Okay. We're the fully full of how foundation, here's how you apply, et cetera, et cetera. The second I was named executive director, it's like people had a place to go. Um, so I now get weekly emails um, from organizations that want to learn more. Um, many of them don't end up being folks who fall within our guidelines, but just given the nature, again, of, of my connection to a law firm that does other partnerships, we have a DEI team, you know, we have other teams, there's usually a way that I can find a way to work together, but it's been a very critical way of kind of like getting our name out there, meeting more folks and getting into their orbit. Thank you. Great, thank you again. Um, does anyone else have a question before we move on to? To Karen, I don't. I don't want to stop the conversation with Maddie, but uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. I've got a follow up if you have time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what is this back end support that you provide? It seems like that's something that might be useful to us if we're looking for people who are really starting out in something. How do you do yeah. that? Yeah, I, again, I, Chalita can talk more, but you know, I know that they put on specific programs. It's like how to work with a board of directors, how to, you know, like, you know, it is for these kinds of smaller organizations that, you know, the people with the incredible, wonderful ideas, but who need help with the the management of a nonprofit organization. So I know that they do programming like that, seminars, also this kind of thing, you know, convenings where different organizations can get together. Um, so it's really great. Our firm has done a couple of those over the years, but, um, you know, it's great to have an organization where that's built in and folks can very easily sign up. That's what they do. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to put that in the chat. Um, the group is called Spur, Spur Local. There you go. Um, and um, how that partnership is is um, with a fixed fee, they provide um, capacity building workshops that are all recorded. Um, so groups can participate in the live ones um, as well as um, access a library of workshops shops um, and, and it ranged from capacity building to fundraising um, to board 
do name it. So it's been a great, um, a great resource. So um, I'm going to move us on to talking with Karen from Wellington. Thanks again um, for uh, for participating, and go right ahead, Karen. Great, thank you, Shalita and Jen for inviting me, and Judy for inviting me. Um, so my name is Karen Pfefferly, and I'm the executive director of Wellington Management Companies Foundation. Um, the, our uh, corporate foundation was started in 1992 with an initial interest in um, financial literacy in um, for youth in underserved communities. But we've uh, quickly expanded that over the years to the point where now we're a broad youth education funder, um, focusing still in those communities that are traditionally underserved. Um, and most of our grant making happening in the Eastern Massachusetts area, which is the headquarters of our firm. But we do make a sprinkling of other grants to programs um, in the other cities in North America and the Asia Pacific region where we have offices. And our London office has a UK foundation that makes grants um, under a similar mission to programs in the UK and in Europe. So um, a pretty broad global um, effort, very much inclusive of employee volunteers to help us with the due diligence in, in reviewing grant applications um, and in maintaining relationships with the organizations that we support to bring what we call um, support beyond dollars to the organizations. Um, so, you know, to, to, for this discussion, you know, what I think is really relevant is about um, 10 years ago. Um, when um, our assets were really um, uh, building up in our endowment, we went through a strategic plan and um, really tried to come out with a grant strategy that um, would allow us to be a long-term and, and, and transparent funder to small to mid-sized community organizations um, to have the most impact on those organizations with gifts um, at a fixed amount for a fixed term. So now we're at um, a portfolio of about 75 organizations that we fund at $60,000 a year for 10 years. Um, and that's really the core of what we do. Um, at the same time, we also wanted to allow for um, really being helping these organizations be transformative in their work. So we have a major gifts program called Catalyst Gifts um, that those organizations in the portfolio are eligible for. They tend to be about $200,000 to $300,000 to really help launch a new program or help them start up in a new geography or really build capacity um, to further uh, deepen their impact with the students they're serving. Um, and um, at the same time, that whole strategy um, was um, built so that in a market downturn, when our assets weren't earning as much, when our donors weren't giving as much, where the firm wasn't giving as much, um, we would be able to be counter, or, and when the needs in the community were increasing, we could be counter cyclical. So um, when the pandemic started in 2020, um, on March 13th, like really as everything was coming to a head, we uh, were able to get money out the door right away to our portfolio of grantees. So in 2020, no questions asked, no, no application required. We got $25,000 to each of our grantees. In 2021, we gave 15,000 and in 2022, we gave 10,000 to all of our grantees. And that money was um, really essential to help them um, um, in many cases, broaden the support that they were bringing to their students. They might not have been able to sort of run their soccer club or have their debate team, but their relationships with the students and their families were so significant that, um, you know, the funding allowed them to really um, stretch a little bit and bring additional support to the families and the students in their network. So that was, that was really rewarding. We also were able to um, do three special initiatives over those three years. In 2020, we got about $700,000 out the door to help with technology for, you know, buying, you know, stronger Wi-Fi routers and getting Chromebooks in the hands of children, um, getting, um, we did a program where we got art packets out um, that we distributed at some of the food distribution sites, um, helping organizations really pivot to remote learning. In 2021, we focused on um, academic um uh, you know, academic enrichment 
and mental health resources that were needed at after school and summer programs and got several million dollars out the door that way. And in 2022, we focused on the, the crisis in early education and really um, helped a number of larger systems and programs um, with teacher retention, um, support for teachers to keep classrooms open and um, other related initiatives. Um, so that over those three or four years, we got um, about $43 million out the door, which was just extraordinary and have maintained um, the ability to um, stick to our core grants programs going forward, which um, tend to average about $8 million a year globally um, to about 100 different organizations. So, you know, really grateful that Wellington as a firm has investors who take that long view and really set up um, our endowment and our spending policy to make sure that we could, um, you know, be um, you know, a reliable funder to the organizations in our portfolio and um, to really um, allow us to grow cautiously um, and to make sure that our impact uh, was always great with the organizations we're supporting. Um, just a couple of things to address some of the questions that Judy and Shalita and Maddie and I spoke about before. Um, we have broadened our definition of education over time to include some upstream programs in teacher training, family engagement, um, and um, uh, mental health resources. Um, some of the things that you know surround education to make sure students are ready to learn and, and in the best position. But the core of our programming is still, or our grant making is still for programmatic grants. Um, um, you know, for all ages, you know, from early childhood education programs, enrichment programs in the schools, after school and summer programs, and a lot of college and career um, uh, pathways programs. Um, we did increase our grant size um, because of inflation and because of what we're hearing about wage corrections. Um, when we launched our program, our um, strategy in 2018, we were giving $50,000 a year, and we're up to 60 now. Um, and that's something we'll review every couple of years. And we feel that that's the right amount to have really significant impact on programs in the sort of $3 million budget and under range, which is sort of the sweet spot that we, we shoot for. Um, I think that's all I had prepared to say. Shalia or Judy, am I forgetting anything that we, we prepped for? No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Karen, for sh sharing. So. Uh... So concisely, all the things that your foundation is up to. Um, so now we're going to move to specific questions. Um, and I see one from Bill. So go right ahead, Bill. Hi, my name is Bill Rosenberg. I'm with Charles U. Inc. Um, you mentioned that you're uh been fortunate because you have your donors that allow you to do, to do this are all your donors from wellington i mm -hmm. i mean it, 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 it's all internal partners that that can give it to them. yeah the the firm is our largest donor and um after that it's probably a group of about 25 retired partners Okay. Um, are our most significant donors, but we also have an internal annual appeal every year and receive, you know, donations as small as $25, 50 $100 from, from about five or 600 employees um, tend okay. to give to the foundation. Thank you. So we have a spend policy. We do hold assets. Um, we have um, about $50 million sitting in assets, um, but we are, we've built a spend policy now where we're taking about 10% of our um, uh, return on assets each year and then whatever comes in and we're pushing that right out through the door. So it's about $8 million a year now. Do I see any other hands? Help me, Judy, if I miss anybody. <laughs> Um, I don't see anybody, but that just uh, sparked a question that I would like to ask if nobody else. So Wellington Management Foundation has, for, 
for many years, I know, kind of been a little bit uh, low key and it's uh, public image, somewhat private, you would say. How mm -hmm. has that um, desire for privacy um, affected your um, grant making ability to kind of be out in the community and be visible with mm -hmm. the grantee partners that you want to be visible with and yet uh, maintain some uh, anonymity or quiet yeah. quietness. Uh, yeah, or humility. We talked about that a little in our prep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Wellington as a firm is a private company and it has always been led by a mission of client firm self. Um, and any publicity that the firm seeks is only if it's in the best interest of clients. And that sort of has been passed on to the foundation as well. And so um, we don't issue a press release or any seek any publicity to total up our grant making and our impact in the community. But to the extent that it would help one of our grantees for them to issue a notice like, oh, we just got a catalyst gift from Wellington, we're, we're more than happy for them to now um, do that and to use our name to leverage, um, um, you know, our reputation in, in talking to other donors and, and seeking other support. Um, you know, I will do events like this and, and I will speak at fundraisers and our employees are encouraged when invited to attend um, events that our, um, our uh, grantees hold. But again, um, it, we don't actively look for those but we will respond when when asked and when it's helpful to to the grantee. So really trying to to again be humble and um, you know even in our grant making decisions, really follow the lead of the organizations because we truly understand that they're in the community, they're working with the students, they know what the needs are best. And so our grants are unrestricted. Um, you know, we really aren't going to uh, follow up and, and ensure that we're paying for program X versus salaries for, you know, general operating. Um, we really invest in leadership and trust leadership to know where our funds will be put to the greatest use. And, um, you know, we believe in totality, the organization is going to have the impact in the community that, that we're hoping to support. Thank you. Morgan, did you have one? Yes. So um, just to follow up on your statement about um, trust with grantees and unrestricted grants for these 10-year, um, multi-year grants, uh, what kind of check-in or grant reporting happens each year? Good question. Um, you know, we've worked with GMA um, for, is it 20 years, maybe? It's a really long time. <laughs> I think since 2010, so 14 years. Um, and they've helped. We we use the Common App from Philanthropy Massachusetts, um, uh, hoping that that's something that uh, grant applicants will already have in their back pocket and that we're not asking them to really create anything unique or unusual for us. Um, we don't ask for a mid-year check-in, but, um, and our grants in that 10-year term are not guaranteed. We set that up as an expectation, um, but it's contingent on an annual check-in. And at that check-in, our employee volunteers will meet with leadership, ask to see current financial statements that GMA helps us review, um, interview leadership, see the program in action, and barring any like mismanagement or mission shift really beyond the, the uh, you know, expectations of youth education. We've never, well, okay, not never. There's one organization that we've um, ended the relationship with prematurely. But, um, you know, for the most part, we, we pick winners, we hope. And, um, you know, we just check in each year um, with the attitude that the check-in is to help build the relationship, not necessarily to like, you know, find, find some sort of gotcha moment. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions that may be pressing? Going once, going twice. 
Myron, did I see your hand? Thank you. I was, I was just trying to type it in the chat, but it's easier. I'm just curious if people could talk to the question of how they deal with uh, when to terminate long-term grantees. We've had some grantees that have, we've probably funded for 15 to 20 years. And to be able to expand to other very worthwhile organizations or communities, um, this seems to be the challenge of how to determine when and how to uh, let go of someone who's still some group that is still doing good work, but to transfer to other other goals. Yeah, we were facing that in 2017 as well. You know, there were some organizations we had funded for 15 or 20 years that were still vital and really doing important work, but we <coughs> wanted some refresh to the portfolio and the opportunity to support other organizations. So we did launch that 10 year expectation and we started everyone at zero, I think in 2018. So we're not yet at a point where 10 are rolling off and 10 are you know, coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still managing that, but um, you know, we will get to a point where um, you know, it'll be much easier to, to refresh the portfolio, but mm -hmm. it's still a bittersweet moment. And it's really sad to, to let some of these organizations go, but we make it clear that that annual funding may be leaving, but any other relationships they've made at the firm with um, donors, with volunteers can absolutely still continue. We're not saying goodbye to all those other ways that we can bring support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our um, breakout. <coughs> Thanks again, Maddie and Karen for sharing your st stories. I'm sure we all wrote copious notes um, and have learned from your experiences. And we look forward in the small groups to learn more from one another. Um, so I'm gonna call on my my colleague, Anna, um, to break us out into small groups. Thanks for her technology expertise because mine doesn't exist. Um, but in that time, um, um, we do have, as Judy said, uh, someone from TMA who's gonna serve as a scribe and someone who's gonna serve as a facilitator. So you don't have to worry about taking notes unless you want to for when we come back together. Um, we have that done for you. Um, and, um, um, and then we have someone to facilitate to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to sh share. Um, and feel free, again, this is your time to learn from one another. So feel free to share share, but also ask each other questions and troubleshoot any issues that you may be facing as well. Um, so again, you have a half an hour um, and we'll give you some warnings so that you'll know that we're closing downtown. Um, but um, let me see. I think that's it. So, um, so uh, Anna, feel free to some to separate us. Um, we have a few questions we put in the ch ch chat that folks will be concentrating on. What are you doing now that is different from three five years ago? What led you to do things differently? And then, um, what process um, in the process of change? What challenges or issues did you face or currently facing? So um, your facilitators will put those questions in the chat, but they're here too, just in case. So Anna, take it. All right, off we go. 